The biblical curse that allegedly condemned all serpents to slither on their bellies all the days of their life was the snake's first piece of bad press. Most reports since dwell on their fearsome features. And none is more recognizable than the cobras. In the old world, travelers to these tropical and subtropical climes can meet all 25 species of cobra. There are 10 species that can spit venom in your eye. Such cobras are the only snakes that do spit, and they're spectacularly successful at blinding an enemy. This Mozambique spitter became notorious to the people who came to live in Southeast Africa. But when not encountering humans or other threats, a cobra is a silent and stealthy hunter of lizards, frogs, and small mammals. Snouted cobras don't spit, but they are a raider of nests. Chicken farmers beware. They're more widely distributed than the Cape cobra, which is confined to Western South Africa. The Cape has the most deadly venom of any African cobra. The Indian subcontinent is the legendary home of the spectacled cobra, the charmer's friend. In Sri Lanka, this is the only cobra, though it is very common. From eastern India to southern China and south to Indonesia and the Philippines stretches the land of the king. At 18 feet, a fully grown king cobra is the longest venomous snake in the world. It contains sufficient venom to kill an elephant. This one's natural home would be in the deep forest. Unnaturally, it is amazingly a welcome guest under the floor of a family home. Overnight, it is kept in a large box. It is fully fanged and due to its size has twice as much venom as any other cobra. And yet this giant, caught in the wild, now seems as gentle as a kitten. These children trust their father completely. If he says it's all right to touch, then they join in vigorously, and the king cobra patiently submits to their examination. But the snake is more than a pet. It's part of the family business. All around are pieces of wood cut from a Changnao tree, believed to contain certain substances that cure snake bite, even the king cobras. This man and others in the village tame young wild king cobras by gentle handling. The snake, not feeling threatened, relaxes and can be carried proudly as an emblem of its owner's trade advertising the healing blocks of wood. The snake may be employed like this for its 20-year life. It really is extremely unusual for so venomous an animal to be handled in this casual way. No wonder it stimulates the sale of the medicinal wood. The blocks are boiled and the infusion drunk or else the wood is shredded and laid on a wound or an aching muscle. The king cobra adds the necessary mystique to the sales pitch. King cobras feed only on other snakes, so each has its own traveling box. About a third of the bites are fatal, three times more than other cobras, even though its venom is considered less toxic. There's a dangerous liaison here one born out of economic necessity. A less dramatic, though still venomous hunter, 
is this forest cobra, arguably more typical of cobras in general. Unblinkable eyes perceive a gray monochrome world. Movement is instantly detected, though the image of its prey is not sharply defined. But other senses are at work. A cobra's tongue is its direction finder, tasting the world and identifying potential threats or prey to the left or to the right. Chemicals from the air and from the ground rapidly dissolve in fluids on the tips of their forked tongue. In the mouth, the fluid samples are drawn to special organs of smell and the snake orientates towards detected prey or away from danger. Likewise, the snaking movement of the body defines the animal. The wave shape stands still. The snake slips past, its belly scales gripping at key points on the ground. Those key points on a tree are the branches. The snake moves, but the bends in its body hardly change shape as it flows upwards. Confronted by other tree dwellers that are not its prey, a cobra prepares to issue a warning. The vervet monkeys will see and hear a remarkable display. Not only does the snake rear up to intimidate, but it broadens the width of its body near the head forming what's known as the hood. The monkey is being warned off. Eyes and weapons are to the front. Height is impressive. This is not an animal to meddle with. To form the hood, a cobra contracts the muscles of its neck ribs pulling these unusually long bones outwards, stretching the skin like an umbrella. Other cobras have a further unique deterrent, an ability to squeeze their venom glands and shoot the liquid through an aperture in the front of each fang. This powerful shotgun scatter is directed towards an enemy's eyes. The cobra's defenses are well known to the people of Sri Lanka. Some 2,000 people are bitten by them every year and over 200 die. Yet the 20 million strong population have long had a special relationship with the cobra. When Buddhism first came to the island more than 2,000 years ago, its beliefs in the sacredness of animals fitted in well with an ancient religion of cobra worship already here. This meant that cobras, despite their venomous character, continued to be worshipped and respected. The king of snakes has always been considered immortal, largely due to its natural habit of shedding its skin as it grows. The ability to be reborn is a characteristic normally associated only with gods. But for cobras, such apparent rebirth is routine. A dead outer layer of skin is sloughed off every four to five weeks, leaving a ghostly remnant patterned with the scales that formed it. Shiny and seemingly new, the cobra will not shed again until its body clock or other chemical or physical cues stimulate the process to start once more. To the eyes of ancient people, the snake's transformation must have seemed miraculous. Add that to the story of the Buddha's first visit to Sri Lanka, and a legendary tale was born.
Under its hood, a cobra sheltered the Lord Buddha from a mighty storm that lasted seven days and seven nights. The grateful Buddha laid two fingers upon the snake in blessing. And those holy and indelible marks are now on every spectacled cobra forever. Today, the spectacled cobra is respected as a protector of the faithful and a deliverer from evil. As the only cobra in Sri Lanka, it leads a charmed life indeed. Four thousand years or more of human respect for the spectacled cobra and plentiful food has resulted in a huge population of these snakes. Little wonder so many people get bitten here. In other countries, a cobra in the home might be killed on sight, but these people, as Buddhists, believe in reincarnation. A cobra is a vehicle for the soul of an ancestor. Harm the snake, and you may harm a grandparent. Sri Lankans work and live side by side with dangerous snakes, but spectacled cobras, fortunately, give good warning of their presence. It's an uneasy truce, but a truce all the same. These men are digging sand from the riverbed. Together with this mahout bringing his elephant to bathe, they create a great deal of disturbance. Everyone knows there are cobras here, but the snakes are easily seen and heard as they react to the commotion. Hooding is not a prelude to biting, just a warning to keep away. Elephants and cobras seem to share an ancient respect. Cobra watching an elephant bathing is just not worth getting excited about. Once the cobra senses that danger is receding, it will continue on its way. But for some people, the hooding of the cobra is a performance to be exploited as a way to earn a living. The breadwinner in this family risks his life working with cobras in his care. He's a traditional snake charmer. When handling the cobra, the charmer's aim is to avoid getting bitten. As well as lizards and frogs, cobras occasionally eat eggs even as large as this. The snake's jaws are greatly expandable. The family is not overly concerned that the charmer is running a risk while encouraging his cobra to eat and drink. In most cases, the fangs and venom glands are present and active. But if the snakes are defanged, replacements grow quickly and the handler is again vulnerable. These men know their snakes well, how they behave, and just how far they can go when manipulating them. The traditional performance is still a crowd puller, 
Though the crowd usually arrives on a bus with only a little time to watch and to take the routine photograph. Some knowledgeable tourists will soon be explaining to the others how cobras care little about the tune. They can only detect very low frequencies and feel ground vibrations. And that what's making them dance is the movement of the charmer, the lid, and the flute. The snakes feel threatened and are reacting instinctively by standing erect and hooding. But such explanations cannot detract from the fascination of the show and the skill of the charmer at knowing the animals and judging a risk. His life can be at stake. In any Sri Lankan village, a spectacled cobra or two are never far away. Though in the heat of the day, they tend to be secretive and hidden, unless disturbed. Just as rats tend to favor human habitations, so the snakes follow in pursuit of the rats, their main prey. But there's often the cobra in the woodpile that bites without the usual warning. Such accidents are a risk these people have always run. What chances have they of surviving a bite? What medicines are available to them in this country where the spectacled cobra rules like a king? As the villagers settle in for the night, the spectacled cobras start to go about their business, hunting rats. On the floor within, a little girl lies sleeping with her mother. She turns and rolls onto a cobra. <laughs> the bite could have been fatal. She received a potentially lethal dose of venom. Fortunately, her family lives close to a modern hospital. Here, she was given an injection of the correct anti-venin as soon as she arrived by bullock cart. Her journey took almost an hour. When she arrived, she was already having difficulty breathing. Now she can smile. She is not to be one of the people who die of cobra bite. Most at risk are workers in the paddy fields. More than half the population tend the rice crops. Within every 12 acres live at least five spectacled cobras. These women are not its prey. A cobra is more interested in rats, but sometimes its warning is not visible. Then accidents happen. Such an accident happened to George Van Horn here at the Reptile World Serpentarium in Orlando, Florida. No matter how expert you are, handling cobras is a dangerous business. George milks venom from 70 snakes every day. He supplies medical research laboratories. In all, he holds 700 snakes, including 12 of these, the king cobra, the snake that normally eats only other snakes. But George has trained his kings to take rats instead. 
Most of these snakes have been raised up here. Uh, the most dangerous consequence of that is the fact that they're accustomed to being fed. When we open the cage, their feeding responses can be, you know, very fast, and it's something you always have to be on the alert for. With this rat alive, the cobra's venom from two large glands either side of its head would now be spreading throughout its body, affecting the nervous system and paralyzing its breathing. On June 21, 1995, George Van Horn was giving a public demonstration of the skill for which he is famous. Okay, I got this night pulled But that day, things went wrong. The king cobra he was to milk thought George was prey. King cobras, when they, when they approach you know, a large object or animal, they'll pause for a second. And this snake didn't. He came straight on and, and, uh, and uh, made a very significant bite. This particular snake was our best venom producer. The snake's a good producer. He had been at rest for three and a half weeks. It was a feeding response bite. You put all that together and you know, you know that it's a real bad bite. I mean, this guy was capable of uh, over two grams of venom on a good day. And this was certainly a good day. It was in June, it was warm, his production level was good, his physiology was, you know, at optimum. And, um, you know, we knew it was a bad bite. They will bite and then they will walk one fang at a time. Each time making a bite and injecting venom. Uh, so that happened and it happened real fast and uh, it took me I'm sure it was just a few seconds, but it felt longer, you know, to get the snake off of my arm. And uh, Bonnie, I, I think she was the only one that said anything. I just heard her say, oh, no. You know, and if she says, oh, no, believe me, uh, it means, oh, no. George knew he had to get to hospital right away. Two drops of King Cobra venom is enough to kill an adult. And George believes he received 20 times as much. He desperately needed anti-venom, and emergency plans were being made nationwide for extra supplies to be flown to the hospital he was being taken to. As he arrived at casualty, he wasn't sure whether he would live or die. I do remember when I was being offloaded, uh, saying something to one of the attendants about, you know, getting me, give me a respirator. King Cobra venom is rapidly spreading through his body, gradually suppressing his neuromuscular systems. On reaching the nerves controlling breathing, he will be in danger of dying through suffocation. Fortunately, a respirator is available to take over breathing from his now paralyzed lungs. Gradually, George recovered, and naturally, he went straight back to work. We still have the snake. I mean, he's still, you know, our, our best king cobra. Good animal. In many other countries, such good animals are kept for their venom, which is used to prepare the anti-venoms that will save the lives of people like George. These are spitting cobras, and they need very careful handling. Even here in Thailand's Red Cross Scientific Institute, accidents can happen. These snakes have been taken from the wild, and the plan is to breed future stock from them. Anti-venoms are urgently needed, but wild populations of snakes do need protection from exploitation. Remember, this cobra can spit, and it usually goes for the eyes. A cobra is milked about once a month. Sometimes the venom glands are massaged to encourage a good yield. When a snake bites for real, it doesn't always release all its venom. Here, the collectors need as much as they can persuade the cobra to yield. It will probably be only a milliliter or so, less than half a thimbleful. Milk enough snakes, and they have sufficient raw material to set about producing anti-venom. Concentration must not lapse. Even the decapitated heads of dead snakes have been known to bite and kill. Yeah. 
This institute keeps its own horses, in whose blood antibodies to the cobra venom will be produced. Greatly diluted doses of venom are periodically injected, and it will take four weeks or so for the antibodies to be produced quite naturally. Once a month, the horses each attend a series of four donor sessions, where blood is drawn from them in large volumes. While the horses have the equivalent of a human donor's snack, the blood is taken to the laboratory to be separated. This process is kept sterile. It's the clear portion of the blood, the serum, that contains the valuable antibodies. This vat only contains serum with antibodies against king cobra venom. The institute can produce a number of different snake antivenoms in varying quantities according to worldwide demand. Snake bite is one of the oldest ills of humanity. Some remedies used today are unimaginably ancient and varied. More than half of all victims in Sri Lanka are still treated by a herbalist and not in a modern hospital. Here the methods of Ayurveda are used, a mixture of herbal medicine, astrology and demonology. Pills, oils, the juices of trees and leaves and the snake stone made from porous animal charcoal are some of the preparations made by the herbalist. Charms will be recited, protecting victim, his friends and the practitioner himself. How, where and by what snake the person was bitten all play their part in the treatments. Sometimes they're successful but then again, the snake doesn't always inject a fatal quantity of venom. As well as traditional medicines, there are the snake bite charmers with their devil dance, designed to exorcise the evil spirit in the snake bite. The snake, some victims believe, has been sent by an enemy. Now, for nearly 10,000 rupees, over $200, the charmer puts on a mask of the cobra and acquires power to drive away the evil spirit and heal the effects of its bite. Imagery and the ritual look powerful, but this is a dying art. Modern medicines, anti-venoms, are mysterious, but are seen to have greater power to cure. Television and advertising are convincing people that a bite victim has more chance of survival in hospital or with a local doctor using Western methods. But these old practices in southern Sri Lanka will die hard. Vestiges will remain for some time yet. This householder hopes that the cobra mask will catch the evil eye of a passing enemy and ward off the malicious intent of any snake in the grass. Cobra is not at all interested in humans. Its eye is on prey such as rats, frogs, even other snakes. A snake doesn't waste venom on its kill. It uses just enough to paralyze the lungs and begin the process of digestion. The rat is not being chewed, but swallowed whole. The cobra uses its jaws and teeth to advance onto the body of its prey. 
copious saliva eases the job, but it still takes up to 10 minutes to swallow the prey completely. The fangs inject the venom. The smaller teeth act as grappling hooks. The jaws expand to accommodate the mouthful. The cobra digests everything, bones and all. Such a meal can nourish a cobra for a whole month. Obtaining a meal is not always that easy. Sometimes a cobra has to face considerable obstacles. This Cape Cobra lives only in western South Africa, and it's partial to weaver birds that nest in large colonies in acacia trees. That can mean a difficult climb, but this tree has fallen over under the weight of the nests. Most colonies have a Cape Cobra living nearby. The nests are an open larder for the snake. The challenge comes when the snake tries to get in. The nest entrances are underneath, but the birds have plump little chicks within. This is the difficult bit. So near, and yet so far. Elsewhere in Africa, a chicken run, rather like a weaver bird colony, is an appetizing target for a cobra. This snouted cobra is a notorious raider and again, it's the chicks the snake is after, not the hens. Unlike the Cape Cobra, this species is fairly widespread and often lives near villages and people. Any second now, the cobra is going to be right among the chickens. <laughs> The cobra can't take any more from the roosters. Crowing it wouldn't hear, but the stamping and flapping were too much. The chick never realized it was in danger. And anyway, the cobra can find other young to hunt tonight. This marsh mongoose is also a night hunter. It has babies to feed in a nearby nest.
the mongoose itself is not in much danger, but its sense of smell detects the threat to its family. The cobra's defenses go up. It can't spit, only strike. And that's not much use against a mongoose whose coarse, wiry fur is difficult for the snake's fangs to penetrate. The mongoose is defending its territory and its young, not looking for a snack of snake. But the cobra is at real risk. Its adversary is tireless at such combat. The snake has less stamina. The mongoose can't waste its trophy, although its real prey is crabs, rats, or frogs. In the water, the mud and sand on the snake's body is washed off. And there's little danger from eating venom. That's only potent if it gets into the blood. The snake was really the unfortunate victim of a chance encounter. Cobras and the mongoose have a much more dangerous predator. The sale of snake skins was very profitable for people and disastrous for snakes until the international trade was controlled in all but a few countries. But within some countries, the exploitation continues. Cobra is still on the menu. This overkill and the felling of their forest home has meant that wild king cobras have become very scarce. Ironically, one of the exploiters, the anti-venom manufacturers, are now having to breed their cobras in captivity. Each king cobra infant emerges with enough venom to kill a human. In the wild, most are eaten by predators, mainly birds and monitor lizards whereas captive-bred babies nearly all survive. Two years from now, this newcomer may be seven feet long. Religion has protected some wild cobras for centuries, but more successful breeding programs and widely available and effective anti-venom against snake bite is a future hope for saving many more. Snakes do have a place in nature, both as predators and as food. But as captive snakes, their role is to produce venom. This is a cobra production line. This scientific institute in Bangkok should need no wild snakes in the future. In two years, these tiny king cobras will have outgrown this nursery, but not until then will they be milked of their venom for the first time. Before the nursery was set up, 400 cobras a year were taken from the wild for this work. Besides preparing anti-venom to treat bites, this institute also has a policy of educating the public about snakes. 19 king cobras live in this enclosure. King cobras are the longest venomous snakes in the world. Chan Pung Nam has become well known for his exciting demonstration of snake handling, though he doesn't recommend that anyone should try it at home. He's already lost a finger as a result of a bite during his performance. More than 12 feet long, this king cobra is of uncertain age, having been caught in the wild. 
Chan still works with it despite the bite. The mistake was Chan's, not the snake's. And it did show that the Institute's anti-venom can save a life, if not a finger. This king holds an audience twice a day. Chan has to keep the snake's attention by moving his knee and foot. He then slowly maneuvers his hand behind its hood, ready for the catch. It was at this moment, nine years ago, that Chan was bitten. There's an element of circus, that fear that the tightrope walker will fall, together with a human fascination for snakes, whether we really like them or not. But it's all in a very good cause, money for the Institute, and a public relations exercise on behalf of snakes in general. These are monocled cobras, identified by a single circle on their hoods. Chan also demonstrates a southern Thai spitter. He's familiar with the snake, but it will only spit if threatened. And it does so right towards his unprotected eyes. A memorable incident and a warning that snakes should not be provoked. Respect should be shown, even by an expert handler. Respect for their snakes is one secret of the villagers who use their king cobras to help sell their curative blocks of special wood. This snake is relaxed at being handled, and so more cooperative and without aggression. It's fully fanged and potently venomous, but as docile as the family dog. Though each is respectful of the other. However, the king doesn't hesitate to advance, rather than slink away. These people have formed a remarkable alliance with this most dangerous snake. Cobra's bite is often fatal, and yet it seems like a pussycat to this family, as unusual a house pet as can be imagined. It has earned its place among them, and they feed and respect it as one of them. 